Hi everyone and welcome to the Chess Me ASMR channel. In this video I'm gonna teach you how to play chess. I'm gonna go through the board setup, the pieces and their features, opening, middle game and end game. And also what is chess tactics and chess strategy. But we, before we get started, I have some good news for you. For everyone who is interested in a chess that I'm using, I've reached out to the manufacturer and they provided me with a 15 euro promo code that you guys can use on any product in their website. So you can go to chessis.art and use a promo code chessmeasmr to get that discount. Well, I'm not receiving anything from it, but if it will make you happy, I'm also happy. So I will put both the website and the promo code on the description, so you don't have to remember it. And let's get started. Firstly, I would like to welcome you in a fascinating game of chess. If you're a new player, I'm pretty much sure you're gonna enjoy it. And if you're an experienced player, well, sit back and enjoy the ASMR. And let's get started. Firstly, we have a chess board on your vision. And before we set up all the pieces, we need to ensure that we have a dark square on our left bottom side. And the same for blacks, dark square on the left, left bottom side. Then we have a coordinate for each one of the 64 squares on the board. The way we identify the coordinates is based on the horizontal lines and vertical lines. Each horizontal line has specific number and since in chess game White pieces always start first. They also are located on the first horizontal line. So it will be number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And white pieces are located on the line one and two, and black on the opposite lines seven and eight. In addition to that, we have a vertical line which has a letter notations. So you'll have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. And well, in combination, it will give us the location of the square. So this dark square that we were talking about is on line one, on vertical line A. So it will be a square A1. And let's say we have any move on the board and this one will be line one, two, three, four, line four, and the letter will be A, B, C, D. So we have D four square. Okay. Well, now we can orient on the chessboard. Let's go to the pieces. But before that, let me tell you why it's important to know the coordinates in the chess game. Well, normally you will have it on the chessboard, but in this case I don't have them. But you can, yeah, with high probability you will see it in most of the chessboards. The reason for that is to be able to record the game and all the moves and to follow them later on. If you have been in any chess form, you have seen all this combination of letters and numbers. And in addition to that, all the pieces has their own letters except pawns. Well, what do I mean? If we move with a pawn to D4 square, there will be no notation for a pawn. It will just tell you D4, meaning that it was a pawn who moved. And all the other pieces has mainly the first letter. We have king, which is treated as k. We have a queen, 
which is a Q, we have a bishop, which is a B, a rook, which is an R, and a knight. Well, since K is taken by the bigger piece king, the knight is notated as N. And you will see, say we have a rook on D4 square, the way it will be noted is R D4. And you will know that it's rook on d4 square. Okay, now let's go to the way pieces move and we're gonna start with a pawn. This is the least valuable piece on the board, meaning the pawns has only one point. Well, each piece has their own values we have a knight and bishop, which are the second uh, on the list. Both of them has three points. We have one point, three point, another three point for the bishop, five point for the rook, and a nine point for a queen. Well, in some cases, bishop is valued as 3.5, but that's just the details. And yeah, it really depends on which pieces you're playing better. What's the position, of course. But in general, these two pieces are equal. All right. And let's look at the game and how we can start it. Well, firstly, we're going to look at the pawns. The way pawns move are forward. And the reason why I show you two different moves is at the beginning of the game, pawns can move one or two squares forward. And you can remember it as, while well, it's the beginning of the game, the pawn hasn't moved yet, and they have enough energy to move two squares. Well, it's optional, they can always move one square, but in that case, they lose their two square move right. Okay. And yeah, basically remember it as, well, at the beginning of the game, they have enough energy, and if they don't use it, they lose it. In addition to that, if pawn is moving two squares, well, they have done a big jump, so remember that they leave some trace just for one move, and I will come back to that later, why they leave a trace, and for what purpose. But okay, let's see an example of a game. We know how the pawns move, so we can start the game. You play e4, and now I play e5, and normally in chess, to capture any piece with your pieces, you are just going to go on that specific square. So, normally, if the pawn is moving forward, you should be able to just take the other pawn since it's in front of you. But for pawns, the case is a bit different. The pawns can move forward, but they cannot capture forward. They can only capture to the one square diagonals. Meaning, after your move and after my move, these pawns are blocked. They can not damage each other. But if you play the move like d5, now I can take your pawn. Or if you move like f5, now I can also take your pawn. But this pawn is safe from my captures. Okay, let's look at another position. Well, we know how to move this pawn, so let's play e4. Well, I decide to move my pawn on a7 to a6. And now you decide to push your pawn further. Well, remember, you have moved two squares. This pawn 
has lost its right to move two squares. Now you come to e5, and now I decide, okay, my pawns is not moved yet, so I can jump two squares. And now remember about the trace I was talking. Why the trace is here, and why it's only for one move left. It's for this little guy here. When I'm moving to squares, well, it's already a big move for pawn, and the trace is there. Means that this pawn can capture it, even though it's not landing on this piece. But since it left the trace, just for one move, this pawn can fill it and take the pawn. Well, what will happen if I, if you do some other move like d5, d4? In this case, the trace is lost and you don't have the ability to capture this pawn now. So you have this chance only for one move after I did a quite athletic move with my pawn. Okay, and there is another feature of the pawn and that's called promoting now let me move out these pieces and let's say this is the position you move your pawn i move my pawn you keep coming and i keep moving my pawns and when you come to the seventh square now what can you do is to well, let me take the rook just for the demonstration purposes, you can give away this pawn and take any other piece. You can take another rook, knight, bishop, or a queen. In fact, you can have more than one queen on the board. You can have nine queens on the board in a chess game. Of course, if you will manage to promote all eight pawns of yours. Okay, pawn is the most complicated piece on the game, but I think we figured it out, and let's go to some other pieces. Now, let's imagine it's the beginning of the game, and what other option you have except moving with pawns. And the other option that you have is to move your knights. And the special thing about knights is they can jump over pieces and that's the only piece that can do that and the way they move is as a letter l so the way to remember it is one two and to the left and the same for black one two to the side to the left or right doesn't really matter and you can do it to all the sides let's say our knight is here, we can move, let's turn the knight, one, two, to the side, one, two, to the side, one, two, to the side, and the same to all eight different sides. The only thing is limiting our move of the knight will be this pawn since it's not allowed to land on the position of your own piece. Okay, we figure out how knights are moving the only thing i forgot to mention is the position of the pieces so the pawns are clear they're on the second and the seventh line you have rooks on the corners you have knights coming after the rooks you have bishops and you have your king and your queen well these are symmetrically positioned the only thing that might be a bit confusing is the position of the queen and the king. Well, there is an easy way to remember it. And that's, remember that queen always like its own color. So the black queen will be on the dark square. And the white queen will be on the light square. Okay, we now know how pawns are moving knights are moving we know that we can start the game with a pawn or a knight move now let's go to all the 
other pieces. And that will be our bishops. Well, I think with bishops and actually all the other pieces like rook and the queen is they don't have any limit in how many squares they can move unless it's not blocked. For example, let's start the game. We know how the pawns move. Well, we have a position here and now you want to take out your bishop. Well, you can move it one square, you can move it two square, you can move it three, four, well, unless any of these squares is not blocked, let's say by a pawn, you will be able to move it. Now, the way all the other pieces are capturing is wherever they can move, they can capture opponent piece on that square. So in this case, we put aside the pawns, they are the only exceptions. The bishop, since it can move to this square, to this square, to e2, to d3, to c4, and to b5. Well, the only limitation for it will be to come to a6 square, since it's not a knight and cannot jump over opponent pieces. But we can take this piece on b5. And another interesting thing about bishops is, well, let's just put some pieces in front so our bishops can move out. Now your bishop on the dark square can also move out. And the interesting part about the bishop is you have one for each square and they cannot change the squares. Well, if your pawn was also out, this bishop of course could have moved also on this side and it can also move. So it's in this position back. So there is no limitation in terms of moving back or ahead and that limitation exists only for pawns. For pawns there is no retreating, only forward. And let's now go to our rooks and well let me try to get the rook out by the playing some game <laughs> never do this in the game but now our rook can go out so rooks are the pieces who move horizontally or vertically and again it's the same as bishop they can move as much as they want unless it's not blocked by anything and they will capture a piece well if this pawn wasn't here they can move to three different squares and the fourth option will be to move to this square and capture the piece but since it's blocked by this pawn you can move it only here same for our rook and now we can move it to any square here there's no limitation let's say i move my rook here and now well, you can move this square and you can also capture it. This is the way rook moves. Well, we have now the most powerful piece on the game and that's the queen. So again, we open up and now think of it as a combination of rook and bishop. The queen can move diagonally, again, no limitation. And let's say I also move my queen and now we can also move vertically or horizontally unless there is something blocking our pass. Even though it's powerful, it's lacking the feature of the knight to jump over the pieces. And we can capture this piece and now it's time for black to play again since it can move to all the sides to all the sides we can possibly imagine we can capture the queen and in fact queen is the strongest piece on the board and you yeah try to defend it as much as possible not to go and capture with your queen 
any other um, lightweight piece. In fact, in the other piece, uh, if you're gonna capture with your queen a rook, you're just giving away a nine point piece for a five point piece. Okay, now we have our last but most important piece, a king. And the way kings move are, well, imagine a queen, but only one square at a time. It can move to all eight sides, but only one square. So we can keep moving and this is the way they move. They can also go back, of course, Okay, no limitation except for pawns. The only limitation for the king is the king should never stay in the attack. So let's say it's, yeah, you move to this square. Now I can move my bishop here. What does that mean? It means your king is checked. Why it's checked? It's on the square which can be attacked by my bishop and captured. And in this case, you actually have a few options, but you need to eliminate the check either by getting rid of this piece or moving your king at this moment. And I will go to that part in details, but now let me give you another example what king can do. And this is related to a best friends on the game. And that's a king and the rooks. And now I will show you why they're best friends. Well, we have a, some opening on the game. And yeah, I know this most only for the sake of demonstrating some stuff. Let me actually continue getting all the pieces out. Yes, and well, now we have a proper chess position on the board. And now let's also remove the queens. Well, now what you can see in the position is the possibility to castle. And um, this is also a concept that might be a bit difficult to grasp at, the, at this moment, but you will understand it is later on. And the way it works is your king. In fact, if all the squares are free toward the rooks and are not under attack, then your king, and this is just one move in the game, but in fact, it's several moves. Uh, if you count it as a, um, let's say, regular moves for your pieces, it's one, two, and the rook is jumping over. This is just one move, guys. And we can also do the same to the other side. One, two, and the rook is jumping over. So you do the castle, and I do the castle. One, two, and the rook jumps to the side of the king. Well, can we do the castle always? No, not really. If, let's say, your knight is here, it's not a possibility. Same here, if your knight is here, it's not a possibility or any other piece on this side. Another thing will be, if any of these squares are under attack, let's say my knight is here, and which squares the knight is attacking. If you remember the way it moves, one, two, and to the side. Only this square is attacked that's on the way to the castle. And now when we have a castle, we are actually going to the square that's attacked by the knight and we cannot do that. And the reason for it is, again, even though it's just one move, think of it as two moves by the king first and then the a rook is jumping and again let's say this pawn is not here but here now this square is attacked and again if the king is trying to pass and castle it's passing through an attacked square which is not allowed another limitation is if your king has moved it means that 
it has lost the ability to castle. If you move the king, you lose the ability to castle to both sides. But if you move your rook, let's say you move your rook on the left side, you still can castle on the right side. But if you move this rook, you lose the ability to castle on the right side too, even if you decide to return it to the initial position. That's the rule. If you have moved with one of the pieces, that piece cannot participate in the castle. Okay, so we now know all the options you have in a chess game, how you can move your pieces around. Now let's look at an important concept like a check. Well, what is check? Check is when you attack my king. And let's look at the position again. Okay, open up. Now you decide to move your queen to h5 square. And what has happened now? Now my king is under attack. It's actually a bad example, but I will show you all the information that you need to grasp here. It's now checked. Well, when your king is checked, you have three options to somehow stop the opponent from capturing your king as a next move. The first one is blocking the way of the check. And one thing is you cannot do that um, when you are checked by knight. And the reason, if you remember, the knight is not actually looking like a sniper, like the bishop, the queen, or the rook, it's not attacking the whole line. It's just attacking squares at the end of its destination. But for queen, we have as a destination all these fields, as a potential destination. So now what we can do is the only option is to block it. Now I will give you another example. Now let's say we played and you played. Now let's say I push my pawn and you push your pawn. Now I play a random move and you check again. Well now again I can block your pass and I can ensure the safety of my king or I can move my king away from the line that's attacked by you. And the third option will be to capture the piece which is attacking my king. Well, now imagine a position like this, doesn't matter how we reached it, but now let's say you're attacking. Well, I have option to block, I have option to block, or I can just Take your piece, which will be the best move in this game. And now think about a checkmate. A checkmate is a position where the opponent king is checked and there is no way to avoid that check and save your life on the next move. Well, what's the difference against check. Well, in check, we can block, we can block, and as a next move, the king is in the safety. But if we are checkmating someone, and let's look at the, the fastest checkmate in chess, actually, and that will start this way. You play f3, and I play e5. You play g4. Now I can checkmate you in one move. Queen to h4. I will say what has happened. <laughs> Why it's the end of the game. But indeed it is. We look at the position. The queen is attacking the king. Can we block? No. The bishop is only moving to this square. The knight can move 
to this square, which is block or to this square. And whatever we play as a next move, I will just take your king. And this is a checkmate. When you do not have any way to avoid capturing of the king in the next move. Okay, um, you have actually all the information to go and play chess, but we can go a bit deeper and look at the chess tactics. Well, what's chess tactics? It's um, firstly, it's a short term moves or a combination of moves that brings you an advantage. It might be a lot of different things and for simplicity, I will show you on the middle of the board now. Ignore this part, but one of the chess tactics is a fork. And now let's say I have my king here and my queen here. And you are playing as a white. We don't care how we reach this position. And the main point here is just to show you the idea behind a tactic like a fork. A fork is a quite smart move. You move your knight to e4. And now what has happened? Well, knight can, as a next move, get the queen and knight can get the king. Well, we are obliged to move our king or to capture the knight. We cannot block the knight, as you remember. And after our move is king, we gonna take a piece which is worth nine points and we only give away three points so this is called a pin uh, sorry a fork well this is an absolute fork absolute fork is when one of the pieces which is forked is king meaning the opponent is obliged either to take your piece since the king is checked or to run it away Okay, now let's go to another fork, which is a relative one. Well, imagine the same situation and we play a knight to e4. Well, we again have a fork, but this time we don't have to move any of our pieces. We can actually continue playing. And the reason for that is the king is not under danger. Well, in this position, I would prefer to run away my queen. I exchanging, giving away my five point piece for a three point is a better choice than giving away my nine point piece for a three point piece. So this is one of the tactics and tactics are referred to a short term uh, moves which brings you some advantage. Another option will be, and this time I'm gonna look at the um, proper game. Let's say you play knight to f3 and I play d6. Well, you develop your other knight and now I move my bishop to g4. And now what has happened? Well, this concept is called pin and pinning a piece is pinning a piece is making it impossible for it to move and not impossible in terms of um, in terms of it cannot be played at all but moving your knight after my bishop to g4 move will make you lose your queen well we have another concept and let's say your king was here this is an absolute pin again the knight cannot move but this time it's mandatory to keep the knight in this square you cannot move this knight at all since as a next move we can capture the king well if the queen is here and the relative pin we can move the knight but we don't want to give away a nine point piece for just a three point 
Okay. Now, a chess strategy. Well, I'm not going to talk too much about chess strategy. The reason for that it's actually a portion of chess for an advanced player. It's a mainly refers to a long-term goal after which you not necessarily get a, a materialistic advantage over your opponent but you might get a better pawn structure and what i mean by better pawn structure well if you remember how pawns can capture means that if let's say I have a knight here i have a structure of pawns like this you have a structure of pawn like this and i decide to capture one pawn well you can capture my knight meaning this is actually not a bad structure of pawns they're defending each other well what about this position now you have three pawns back to back to back and let's say my knight is here now well in this case this pawn is not defended by anything and i can take it and this is a bad pawn structure well the whole idea of the strategy is to bring you in such a position that in the mid of the game you have a bad pawn structure you have a bad position um, your yeah i'm controlling the squares the key squares let's say mainly it's the mid of the board since you have much better visibility if any piece is located on the middle of the board and this is related to strategy well the beginning le beginner level the strategy is not extremely important and may, most of the games are won by a tactics okay and now let's go to the openings and middle game and actually also to the end games are what you need to know about all this stuff well first of all let me talk about the openings the openings is the part of the game which has quite some theory behind it meaning it was already studied a lot by professional players and you don't really have to invent anything here you can play the existing openings um, that yeah, was invented you can study it and so on it's very important though to understand the idea of the opening since if you learn let's say one line where this is played i play you play your knight okay you know that after i play this knight here you should play the bishop here well okay but what you gonna do if let's say i play my pawn here and you decide to follow the light well this is now a bad situation <laughs> well it's a ridiculous example but um, you got the idea that you need to understand what's the point what's the square you are going for well each opening i would say has their own advantages and disadvantages but the most played one for white will be either e4 and e5 and this is actually was my uh, favorite opening like long time ago I, I used to play it like a lot of games were continuing oops like this so knights and as you can see the whole point here is develop your pieces take them out um, go for a castle make your king safe king safe is super important in this game then develop the other piece okay let's say this bishop comes here so we have a position like this and yeah this is coming from a sequence of the moves at the beginning in the opening well what can i say about the opening again the main goal is to capture the center to develop your pieces and make your king safe as soon as possible and about the most popular openings the e4 and d4 well i used to play e4 but i really recommend you to play 
d4 and the reason for that black does not have too many options if you play d4 after e4 there is a bunch of openings with can challenge this pawn a lot there's a french opening with the idea of pushing this pawn there is a karakan opening again with the idea of pushing this pawn and trying to destroy the center for white there is also scandinavian opening again challenging this pawn and if you play it with the queen's pawn now let's say some of the options are not really an option because this pawn is defended well, it's again comes to a theory what you uh, what way you like to play are you an aggressive player are you a defensive player and so on well what is middle game the main goal of the middle game is to get a materialistic advantage there is not a clear um, split between an opening and middle game or middle game and end game um, normally the middle game is called the position where all the pieces are developed well let's say we can have a position like this let's continue and well, I'm playing very basics I don't really think about what opening it is and so on um, but let's say we have a castle after all these moves uh, let me adjust all these pieces and we yeah you have castled i've castled let's say you decide to move the queen not a good move because you cannot give away the exchange the knight and open up the king's pawn but this can be called a middle game the reason is all the pieces are developed now we are going to a part of the game where yeah like the theory part is gone and the middle game is the one which is studied the less because of the complication of the position and your main goal here is to get a positional advantage but if you're a new player it will be mainly try to get as much material of your opponent and give away as less as possible and the last one will be the end game and end game is Again, there is no clear split between a middle game and end game, meaning you can't really identify whether it's a middle game or early end game. But the thing about the end game is, and I will move away all the pieces just to be able to show you what you need to know. I hope it wasn't too loud. What you need to know about the end game and what can be studied what need to be studied okay well you can have a bunch of different end games and i will give you just a few concepts so you have an understanding on what need to be studied and so on well now let's say we have a you have a king and i have a king well in addition to that you have a knight only well you should know that in this position actually it's just a draw because it's not possible to checkmate with king and knight but and this is just a basic end game theory and you will get the concept since with time the more pieces there are it gets harder and harder and also um, checkmate let me actually remove it with a bishop and knight is also possible but it's actually a difficult one <laughs> you really need to study it with two bishops also possible a bit less difficult than with a knight and bishop but yeah also something you need to learn but before learning all this stuff uh, I wouldn't recommend going jumping to the knight and bishop checkmate or two bishop checkmate but with a rook and this is actually quite simple so you need to know that oh I can checkmate this game and win it and the whole idea is you should push this yeah 
king to the last corner and for that you always need your king because yeah, the black king doesn't really want to get to the last rank because it, no, it's the end for it and yeah like you need to have some sequential moves and slowly if you know the theory you will be able to push the king to the last line and checkmate it the same will be for a um, king and queen ending you should know that this is a checkmate and you can win it also a position like a pawn and a king you should know in which case you can actually promote this pawn and which case it won't be possible for example in this case i don't want to go to details but actually the black can stop this pawn from getting promoted or you should know that the pawn on the corner is well in this position is impossible to promote um, yeah that's a uh, bad luck for this pawn it's really hard to promote them at the end game but yeah your objective should be just know that it's not possible unless the black blunders very badly in the game well guys this is all about chess actually you can go to any any online chess and, and start playing having an idea of what you're doing well further it just go to learning practicing and enjoying the game uh, i think it's a long video but i hope you learn something grab something valuable for yourself and enjoy playing chess bye bye